If you're born again, you've got something to sing about, right? Amen. Amen. All right. Now, if you have your Bibles, and I hope you have, turn the book, in the book of Acts with me this evening. Acts chapter number 21. Acts 21. Acts chapter number 21 and verse 8. And the next day we that were of Paul's company departed and came to Caesarea. And we entered into the house of Philip the Evangelist, which was one of the seven, and abode with him. Father, bless your word now. In thy name I pray. Amen. You can be seated. Folks, the book of Acts is quite a remarkable book, as I've said before. It's the first written history of the early New Testament church. It's what it's dealing with, the history of the church. Christ has ascended back to glory. He has sent the Holy Spirit. And now the dissemination of the Word of God goes out. The preaching of the gospel goes out to the ends of the world. And it's quite a remarkable thing when you see how the Holy Spirit opens doors, closes doors, moves people here and there to get the job done. Truth of the matter is, it's not us for us to find the way. He'll make a way to get God's Word out. The apostle said, pray an open door would be given to me. Now the last chapter of the book of Acts is chapter number 28. And it says something here, if you want to turn there with me, you can. Acts chapter 28 and verse number 24, it says this. And some believe the things which were spoken, and some believe not. So it is today. Nothing's changed. And when they agreed not among themselves, they departed. After that, now watch this. He quotes the scripture. After that Paul had spoken one word, well spake the Holy Ghost by Sias the prophet unto our fathers, saying, Go unto this people, and saying, Hear, ye shall hear, and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see, and not perceive. Now watch this. For the heart of this people is waxed gross, their ears are dull of hearing, their eyes have they closed, lest they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and should be converted and I should heal them. Be it known, therefore, to you that the salvation of God is sent unto the Gentiles and that they will hear it. And when he had said these words, the Jews departed and had great reasoning among themselves, and they, deal, and they still do. And Paul dwelt two whole years in his own hired house and received all that came to him, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no man forbidding him. Thus ends the book of Acts. The book of Acts is probably, I feel like, and I may be wrong, but I feel like it's written before 70 AD because there's no record in here whatsoever of the destruction of the temple, which took place at about 70 AD. The book of Acts is a transitional books, book, and it is also contingent upon certain things happening. And when we get to the last chapter of the book of Acts, we find that the Jews, according to God's prophecy, once and for all are either settled as believers or unbelievers. And for those that do not believe, he quotes Isaiah chapter number six. And I want you to see it with me if you would. Isaiah chapter number six. The apostle quotes this book and he makes an application of it. It's a wonderful thing when you see the Old Testament scripture quoted and then applied because that's quite a remarkable thing. Isaiah chapter number six and verse number eight. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I, send me. And he said, Go and tell this people, Hear ye indeed, but understand not. See ye indeed, but perceive not. Make the heart of this people fat, make their ears heavy, and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and convert, and be healed." This scripture is quoted over and over again in the New Testament, and it's quoted in the book of Acts as it completes the history that's recorded there for us. And what comes of that is the 11th chapter of the book of Romans, where their eyes have been closed spiritually to the identity of the Lord Jesus Christ. They have been blinded. And so we find there's a big deal here because when you blind a whole group of people, then you've got to have something going from that. And they do because he said, know this, that the gospel will go into the Gentiles and that the Gentiles will hear it. 
I've been to Israel a number of times. I've been to what's called the Dome of the Book. And uh, it's, it's, in a, it's, a, it's a dome, and inside there's a round thing right smack in the middle of it. And that whole 57-foot-long scroll of Isaiah the prophet is displayed. And of course, this is a facsimile. The real thing's not there. But that 57-foot-long scroll of Isaiah is right there for you to see when you walk in. When you walk in, you look at it. You're looking at a book that was written 700 years before Christ. All right? This is important now. 700 years before Christ, the book of Isaiah was written. 586 B.C., the children of Israel and the southern two tribes of Benjamin and Judah were carried off into Babylonian captivity. 722 B.C., the northern ten tribes were carried off into Assyrian captivity. So the book of Isaiah fits in there at 700 B.C. He's prophesying about what's going to happen to the children of Israel even though they go into their land, they come back, he said, I will send forth my hand the second time to bring these people out, and he will, and that is yet to be fulfilled. What you've got here in the book of Acts is a statement by the Holy Spirit that these people have been blinded and that they have been set aside, they have been pushed aside, and that now the focus of the word of God is no longer to the Jew, it is to the Gentile. When you look at that 57 foot long scroll of the book of Isaiah, it's written in what's called uh, Paleo Hebrew. And you have seen Hebrew letters today. You know the square type letters. How many of you are aware of what I'm talking about? These letters came out of the Babylonian captivity of 586 BC. The form of the letter changed. The name of the letter didn't, but the form did. But before that, before that, in 700 BC, you have the Paleo letters. These are the same type of letters that were found inside that tunnel where they found the Pool of Siloam. You remember the Pool of Siloam? Inscribed upon the side there. These, uh, this, the Isaiah quotes it where they could hear the axemen, the picks on either side. They could hear it. And so they inscribed it right there in stone. The Brits come along and they carve it out and they take it to the British Museum. That's where it is right now. It's called the Siloam Inscription. It's one of the most magnificent things from the history of Israel because it is a physical attestation to the actual scripture itself carved in stone. So when the Bible says in Isaiah chapter number six that something is going to happen, you can believe it because Isaiah is a real book and it took place exactly as God's word said that it would. You've got in your hand a book called the book of Isaiah, 66 chapters long. That is quoted more than once in the book of Acts. There's another place it's quoted in the book of Acts and we'll get to it in a moment. It is so important, so important that the writers of the book of Acts wants to, quotes that book of Isaiah and makes an application of it to show you how that God's word is going to be fulfilled exactly as God said it would. People in the Gentiles today, they say, how come the Jews don't believe? Do they believe Jesus is the Messiah? All kinds of questions that apply to the Jews today. If you read your Bible, you'll find out why they don't believe and you'll find out what happened to them and you'll find out why it happened to them and you'll find out that when it happened to them, it was a direct fulfillment of Bible prophecy. So when you go to the book of Acts chapter 21 and verse number eight, we're reading about a man called Philip. If you'll remember, there were seven of them set aside earlier in the book who were to serve as diaconon, deacons, servants, and they were to serve the needs of the early New Testament church. Well, that one of these diaconon wound up being a preacher. You mean to say preacher? A deacon can preach? Sure, he can preach. <laughs> This is, not, you know, this is not first deacon that has wound up preaching. He became an evangelist because God called him into the ministry to preach his word. Amen. And so I want you to notice what's said of him. Look at Acts chapter number 6 and verse number 5. Acts 6 verse 5. Here's what it says about Philip. It says, and they saying, please the whole multitude... And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost. What happened to Stephen? Anybody know? Exactly. He was stoned to death. 
and uh, full of faith in the Holy Ghost, and Philip, see here it is, Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch, whom they set before the apostles, and when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them. So Philip was chosen by the people themselves, because they had great respect for him. They believed the hand of God was on him. They believed he was real. So they chose him to be one of the servants of the early New Testament church. They had seven deacons to begin with. And they had thousands and thousands and thousands of people. So it didn't take too many deacons to take care of thousands and thousands and thousands of people. Amen. Yes, it did. And they were chosen. In verse number three of Acts chapter number six, it says, Brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we appoint over this business. You suppose the church knew when someone was full of the Holy Spirit? Sure they did. You just like you know if someone is full of the Holy Spirit. That's one of the great lessons of maturity in Christ is to learn either a man is full of himself <laughs> or he's full of the Holy Spirit of God. Amen. And you want someone full of the Holy Spirit. You remember the message this morning? And I was talking about this issue. How the communion with God. To commune with Him, my friend. And it says in the book of John chapter number 15, to abide in Him. To abide in Him. That literally means to trust Him. To put everything in His trust. That's what abide means. If it breaks down around you, don't run. Don't turn your back on Him. Don't leave Him. Abide in Him. Cry out to him. And the song that says, bow the knee, is a good representation of what that means. He's the Lord, and he's the sovereign Lord. It's not easy sometimes to accept his will, but he's still almighty God. In Acts chapter number 6, in verses 5 and 6, the scripture says here plainly that he was chosen by his brethren, as I said. And then chapter number 8, verses 5 through 12. Acts chapter 8, verses 5 through 12. Here's what it says of him. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. And the people with one accord gave heed to those things which he spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. Now look at this. For unclean spirits crying with a loud voice came out of many that were possessed with them, and many taken with palsies, and that were lame were healed, and there was great joy. In the city, Philip is being used mightily of God. Why? Because he's full of the Holy Ghost, because he's been set aside to preach the word of God. He's doing what he's been called to do. Now, a lot of folks don't believe in this, but I do, folks. If you start preaching the word, you need a call from God. You know why? The Bible said, make your election and calling sure. Preaching is not just something that you do as a sideline. If God's called you to preach, then preach. Amen. Amen. When I first started preaching, I went, to the, I went downtown on Gay Street and preached in the rescue missions, preached in the back of pickup trucks, preached in parking lots, preached on the street, preached all over the place. Wherever God would open a door and allow me to do it, I'd preach. preach it. I remember one of the first churches I preached in, it was, a, it was, it was, it had, it was just like, you know, well, you ever seen a shotgun house? <laughs> I mean, know what a shotgun house is. All right. It wasn't a very big church, but they were good people. Amen. A lot of young men today, they expect to be right to the top, but you learn, you learn as you move up and as God blesses you and as he opens doors for you. This is what happens with Philip. And so the Bible says in verse 9, there's a certain man called Simon, which before time the city used sorcery and bewitched the people of Samaria, giving out that himself was some great one, to whom they all gave heed from the least to the greatest, saying, this man is the great power of God. And you see how ignorant people can be, how easily fooled they can be. And the reason for this is because the Gentile folks is naturally superstitious. He's naturally superstitious and he's ignorant. You look in the Old Testament and you read about the pagans and you'll find out some of them say, well, he's a God of the mountains or he's a God of the valleys or he's a God of the wind or he's a God of, the, a, a, a God of stone. He's this, he's that, he's this, he's that. And the reason for that is because of ignorance of who the Lord God Almighty is. Where did the truth of God come from? Who told us about the truth of the Almighty? Who told us who He is and, 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 and the God that He is? The Jew did. Israel did. You got that from the Bible. You didn't get it from a Gentile. 
Don't ever look to a Gentile to get the truth today unless that Gentile is preaching a Jewish Bible. <laughs> Amen. Amen. What do you mean Jewish, folks? Some say Luke was not a Jew. I don't know. I won't argue with you. But I'll tell you this. Every book in that Bible was written by a Jew. Right. Amen. Amen. That Amen. book, the oracles of God were given to the Jews. That's a Jewish book. Amen. Not a Gentile book. I don't need Gentile Bibles. This is a Jewish Bible inspired of God. So Philip was a preacher of the word of God. He was endued with power. Acts chapter 8 verse 5, he went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. That's the message. That's still the message. Nothing's changed about the message. If the church today would go back to its roots and start preaching what we ought to preach, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ, the finished work of Christ, the sinner needs salvation, the blood atonement is necessary to wash your sins away. If you preach the new birth and preach these things, you'd be surprised at how the Gentiles would wake up because they've never heard it. Most of the churches around today, when they go to them, it's about all about how feel good about yourself, how God has all these great blessings for you. All you got to do is just understand how to reach up and take hold of it, name it, claim it, blab it, grab it, and all that. That's the kind of thing they're getting today. That, that's, that's the kind of preaching that they're used to. They're, they shock to death when they hear the word of God. Look at Luke chapter number 24 and verse number 46. He preached the one who suffered for our sins. In Luke chapter number 24 and verse number 46. Thus it is written and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. That's the heart of the gospel. Christ went to the cross and he suffered. It's vicarious suffering. Suffering in the place of someone else. And so he did. He preached Christ and he preached the Lord Jesus to them. He didn't preach Judaism to them. He didn't preach a new form of Judaism. He didn't preach the law to them. He preached Christ to them. And the apostle said, Christ is the end of the law to them that believe. In, in plain words, it is the, it is the, it is the consummation, the, the perfection, the end. When Christ is preached, there's nowhere else to go from that point with any law. The Lord Jesus is the finish of the law. The Bible says in the book of Acts chapter number 8 and verse number 6 about Philip. Here's what it says. Acts 8, verse 6. And the people with one accord gave heed to those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. So God had empowered him. This man had power on him. For unclean spirits crying with a loud voice came out of many that were possessed with them. Why? Because when the Holy Spirit shows up, wicked demons flee in terror. In terror. In terror. You don't need formulas to get rid of demons. Amen. You need the power of the Holy Spirit of God. Amen. Amen. And have you ever seen someone come to church and uh, they walked in uh, kind of laid back, uh, cavalier like, uh, lackadaisy. Uh, and, and, but when they get in here and the Holy Ghost begins to move in this house, they get uncomfortable. How many have ever seen that? Amen. I'm up here where I see it. Oh, yeah. I've seen the smirk on their face. I've seen, oh, yeah, you know, move me. One of these deals. And the Holy Spirit began to move in this place and they start looking around. It's like this. They do. You know why? Because it is completely foreign to what's inside them. They don't know how to handle it. But the best thing could be that they'll sit here and they'll listen and let the Holy Spirit move in their heart. And the Holy Spirit draw them to Christ. And the Holy Spirit lead them to the cross. And there they can be born of the Spirit of God. Amen, amen, amen. He was empowered. In the book of Acts chapter number 8. And verse number five, look what it says. And the people with one accord gave heed to those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. And in verse number eight, there was great joy in that city. Now, where are we here? He went down to where? Verse five. This is something that uh, when you're reading the Bible, you need to know this. Anytime you leave Jerusalem, I don't care if you go to Mount Hermon. 5,000 feet in the air, whatever, you're going down. When you come to Jerusalem, you go up. Why? Because Jerusalem spiritually is higher than any place around there. So that doesn't make any difference about the geographical height, the altitude of, the, of whatever's around it. Jerusalem is up and everything else is down. So it says in verse number five, Philip went down to the city of Samaria. Now who are the Samaritans? You remember in John 4? 
He said, I must needs go through Samaria. What's going on here? This is the book of Acts, the historical record of the early New Testament church, and they're going to the Samaritans so they can get the gospel too. This is not an accursed people that can't receive the truth. They can receive the truth. And he goes and he preaches it. And what happens? God Almighty moves in their midst. The demons are fleeing. Unclean spirits crying with a loud voice came out of many that were possessed with them. And many taken with palsies were lame, were healed. So here you have a wonderful move of God while Philip is preaching in Samaria. And this is good. This is a good thing. If you think that the ministry of God can be done by your power and your authority, you're dead wrong, folks. And intellect won't get the job done either. You need the anointing of the Spirit of God. You need the power of the Holy Ghost when you go preach His Word. And that, my friend, makes all the difference in the world. So he brought great joy to the Samaritans. Acts chapter number 8 and verse number 26, it says this. The angel of the Lord spake to Philip, saying, Arise, and go toward the south unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. Now here we are. He's in Samaria, and God's using him. Demons are fleeing. People are being healed. People are being saved. And all of this is happening. And why in the world? Would God reach up there and take this evangelist, Philip, and remove him from that place and put him down there in the desert? Why would he do it? He did it for the same reason that Christ said, I must needs go through Samaria. One woman at the well of Jacob, one woman, Christ went to preach the word to her. One Ethiopian eunuch that had under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, he had been to Jerusalem, he was worshiping, and he was reading a book of the Bible. What book was that? Isaiah. Exactly. Isaiah chapter number 53. Remember what book's quoted in the last chapter of Acts? Isaiah chapter number 6. Isaiah is quoted over and over and over again, New Testament. It's almost as if you can read the book of Isaiah and get a chronological picture of what God's getting ready to do as the Holy Spirit moves. And here we are, Isaiah 53. He's reading it. This is remarkable. Verse 27, he rose, went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, eunuch of great authority under Can Candace, or Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who'd had the charge of all her treasure and had come to Jerusalem for to worship. He was a man of, of authority. He had charge of her treasure. She trusted him. This is a trusted servant. And was returning, sitting in his chariot, read Isaiah the prophet. Esaias, of course, in Greek, but it's Isaiah the prophet. And then the Spirit said to Philip, go near and join thyself to this chariot. Philip was completely obedient to the, the Spirit of God, telling him what to do. Yeah. He did it. Philip ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah. He heard him, and he heard him reading it. Now, this, was, of course, was incidental, wasn't it? It was coincidence. It just happened to happen this way, right? No. Well, of course not. God Almighty had him reading Isaiah. He certainly didn't. No tell him what all he'd read and how many, he might, how many books of... of and of course, what Bible did he have, by the way? What was he? What Bible did he have? How, does, was that all he had? Well, of course it is. Twenty, yeah, yeah, the book of the Old Testament. All right, he the Tanakh they call it. So the Bible says he ran thither and, he, and heard the prophet. He heard him read the prophet Isaiah. Said, "Understandest thou what thou readest?" He comes to the point, and he said, "How can I, except some man should guide me?" Now, this is quite remarkable because I'm sure this eunuch was, uh, I mean, he was literate. Here he's reading. You know, that meant that he had, a, he had an element of education. And he was reading. He had the text in his hand. He had the Bible in his hand. And yet, by reading it, he still needed help to understand it. Now, that's something. That's, that's, that's good. That's really good. You remember what I said to you before? And, you know, sad enough until it really gets a hold of you. If you won't use another man's brains, it's a good indication that you don't what? Have any of your own. That's good. <laughs> it really is. You'd be surprised how many times I've gone to people that lived in the 1800s or the 1700s and used their brains. <clears throat> would you use what another preacher uses any day of the week? Yes, sir. I mean, would you... <laughs> Oh, you know, I've heard a young, some, some preacher said, well, I want to go, to go preach what God gives me. Yeah, son, he'll give you a lot of stuff. Just get out there and listen to the men and listen to the message that have been put out there. You'd be surprised how much good stuff you can get out of it. Amen. We all do it. <laughs> all preachers do that, have been doing it, doing it for a long time. 
Amen. I even one time was in a meeting somewhere and heard a good message and I went up to the preacher and I said, you don't care if I use that, do you, brother? Well, I know, son. He said, do you go out there ahead and use it? He said, I got it from somebody else too. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> That's what you do. It's God's word, isn't it? Well, of course it is. Understandest thou what thou readest? How can I? This, of course, is the understanding of the Word of God, okay? This is the bringing forth the Scripture. What is it? How do you understand it? The Bible says that they rightly divide the Word of Truth, right? You rightly divide it. You understand it. You can read the text, and, and for the, they say that the Bible's written at about a seventh grade level. You can read the text, but what's in it? What does it mean? Who's it talking to? What is this? Who is this person? This is what the eunuch said. Now, listen, that shows he's a smart man. That shows he hasn't jumped to conclusions. That shows that he knows he's got a book in his hand. He's got a book that was written at 700 B.C. He's got a book in his hand that is highly loved and respected by all of Judaism. And he's reading the 53rd chapter of Isaiah. And Philip, that's been in Samaria, is brought down to him. And he comes to him. Now, why is he in here? He's in here so you can understand how to open the word of God. This Bible was written for the age 2023 20, that we live in right now. Do you think God knew that it'd last this long? Of course he did. Why is the Bible written the way it is? It's written the way it is because it's going to be for every generation that follows after. 53rd chapter of Isaiah. And I'm sure that uh, if you've been saved any period of time at all, you've read 53rd chapter of Isaiah. It's one of the most. Now in the 53rd chapter of Isaiah... You might want to, uh, I'm sure you've heard this, but I'll say it again tonight. Uh, Jewish rabbis have a problem with the 53rd chapter of Isaiah. They get very uncomfortable when you get them to the 53rd chapter of Isaiah. Have you ever heard the story where uh, a uh, Christian evangelist uh, quoted the 53rd chapter of Isaiah and applied it to Christ to some young Jewish person? And the Jewish person said to them, well, I don't listen to the Christian New Testament. I, I don't want to hear the Christian New Testament. And the evangelist says, I'm quoting from your Old Testament. In other words, you didn't even know it was in there, did you? And the reason you didn't know it was in there is because your rabbi won't touch it. Amen. This is one of the most powerful passages in the Old Testament that apply directly to the Lord Jesus Christ. And they know it. It's just like the servant of the Lord of Isaiah 40, 41 and 42. They try to make it Israel. The servant of the Lord is not all. It is in one place, but not always. The servant of the Lord is the Lord Jesus Christ who comes to this world. So he's reading the 53rd chapter of Isaiah. He said, how can I accept some man should guide me? And he desired Philip, he would come up and sit with him. And the place of the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter and like a lamb dumb before his shearer. So opened he not his mouth in his humiliation. His judgment was taken away. And who shall declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, of whom speakest the prophet this? Of himself or of some other man? Now, you know, when the books of the New Testament were written, folks, they weren't all just written in one place and compiled together. And here you've got, uh, you've got the New Testament books, 27 New Testament books. Didn't work that way. Didn't work that way. One book was written here. Another one was written over here. The one who wrote this book over here may never have seen that one that wrote this book over here. But in the first century after Christ, they started bringing them together. And as I said the other day, the Syriac Peshito, it goes back to the oldest when it brings the books of the New Testament together. Okay? They're brought together. You follow what I'm saying? You've got a, you've got a book bound up here. You've got 66 books. But folks, that's not the way it's always been. So if all you had was Isaiah, and you didn't have anything else, and that's the way you would have it, more than likely. You'd have a scroll. Because when they found the book of Isaiah at the, at the Dead Sea Scrolls, and they found the book of Isaiah, they found a scroll, okay? It was wound up, that scroll. They didn't find a whole book of Bible, books of the Bible. They found the scroll. They found different books of the Bible, but they weren't together like this. Are you following what I'm saying? Yes. Okay. So when they had the book of Isaiah, they had the one book. It would, it's very, uh, it's very uh, easy to understand or to believe that, that there may have been people that the only book they ever saw was the book of Isaiah. Right? Of course. So who is he talking about, he said, which is a, that's a legitimate question. He said, who is this? 
And uh, Philip opened his mouth, verse 35, and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. Now, what is that? That's interpretation. See, he, an application. He interpreted the text and applied the text to the Lord Jesus. Now, could it be anyone else? No. No, there's only one Lord Jesus. And the 53rd chapter of Isaiah is a classic. He preached Jesus. Now, look what happens. And as they went on their way, they came to a certain water. And notice that he went down, verse number 26, the desert. See this? He's in the desert. <laughs> All right. And then as they went on their way, they came to a certain water. And the eunuch said, see, here's water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And what did Philip say to him? It's pretty simple, isn't it? If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. Well, what does it say in Romans chapter number 10? With a heart, man believeth unto righteousness. And with a mouth, confession is made unto salvation, right? Yes. Exactly. Where does salvation originate then? In the mind or in the heart? In the heart. Now, here's what he said. This is beautiful. Then he said, if thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, now look at this. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Amen. And it's obvious that that's what Philip had preached to him. When he preached Christ, he preached him to be the Son of God. He commanded the chariot to stand still. They went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, that the eunuch saw him no more. And he went on his way rejoicing. But Philip was found at Azotus, and passing through, he preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. I can't imagine what went through Philip's mind. I really do. I mean, zip, zip. And I mean, <laughs> I mean <laughs> he, he caught him away. I, this is not easy to get a hold of what's going on here. Was it like John in Revelation? I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. You know, has he, has he physically moved him? I think he physically moved him yes. from the south to the north. Yes. And, uh, but when he did, was he up in the sky moving around, watching the clouds fly by? I mean, what? he moved him physically from one location to the next. And when he got there, Philip just picked his Bible up and started preaching Christ again. Amen. 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 If you want something exciting, read the Bible. <laughs> to me, that's pretty exciting. Yes, sir. Move from one place to the next. He went down there at the direction of the Holy Spirit, did what God called him to do, and then the Spirit of God took hold of him, caught him, and took him to Zotus. And away he went. <laughs> My, what a thing. Isn't that something? Well, that's Bible days. Oh, don't be so quick to say Bible days. God can do anything he wants to anytime he wants to, anywhere he wants to. Be careful you don't entertain angels unaware. <laughs> so anyway... He obeyed the voice of the Holy Spirit, and he did exactly what God called him to do. So what is, who is Philip? Philip is a chosen vessel of the Lord. The people had great faith and trust in him. And he started out his ministry and service to the Lord as a deacon. And then God laid, up, laid his hand upon him and called him into the ministry to preach. And so he began to preach and became an evangelist. And, and then God used him to open up the, the, the Bible not just to the Ethiopian eunuch, but to us who read this. The Bible, if, if you can read the 53rd chapter of Isaiah and say in your heart, well, that's not applying to the Lord Jesus. Well, then what are we doing with this? Of course it is. The 53rd chapter of Isaiah. Isn't that remarkable, though? 2,000 years ago, they could take that Old Testament text and they could read Christ in those scriptures. He said, search the scriptures for in them you think you have eternal life. And they are they that testify of me. What a thing. What a wonderful thing. And so he was taken to Azotus. And passing through, he preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. And he stayed faithful to his call from Christ. Amen. He abided in the calling wherewith he was called. He did what God called him to do. And he was, uh, when you do what God calls you to do, if you're doing what the hand of the Lord's laid his hand upon you to do, there'll be a satisfaction about it. There will be. There'll, there'll be a satisfaction. Yes. And uh, there'll be peace. And you won't be, you won't be wrestling and struggling with it. Um, I've seen a lot down through the years of people that uh, they mean well, and 
no doubt in my mind about it, but it is not my place to tell somebody whether they're called to preach or not. Amen. That comes from God. Yes, sir. That's not my job. Amen. That's not my place. And I've heard preachers say that, well, I, I let them know. No, you don't let them know. God will let them know. That's not my calling. Amen. Because we don't all minister the same way in the same place. We we'll leave that to the hand of the Lord. Amen. I went to my pastor when I first, uh, God first called me to preach. And uh, I, uh, Bill Cardwell was my pastor. I said, uh, brother, I said, how did you know when God called you to preach? <laughs> well, yeah, you couldn't. <laughs> now, when you say that to a pastor, what do you think he's going to think? He said, well, I'll tell you what to do. Put your fleece out. I'm like, what? Because I hadn't read a whole lot of the Bible. I, I vaguely knew about Gideon and his fleece. I said, okay, where's my fleece at? How am I going to put my fleece out? What am I supposed to do here? He said, put your fleece out. And so I started putting my fleece out. And uh, fleece here and fleece there and this and that and pray and look up here and wonder and search my heart. And I thought, well, maybe this is just, just some passing nothing, you know. And so just get up and walk away from it and forget it, but it won't leave you. It won't leave you. You won't leave you. And so finally, when I got on my knees, I said, Lord, this is what you've called me to do. This is my life. This is what it, I'll do it. I'll do it. And then there was a peace that came upon my soul yes. and pure terror. <laughs> <laughs> Y'all try preaching sometime. <laughs> Amen, brother. I told you before, I told my pastor that Sunday morning, I said, God's called me to preach. He said, all right, son, preach this evening in the evening service. I said, you got to be kidding me. You mean that's all the time I got to get ready? And I went in the bedroom, shut the door, locked the door, isolated myself and sweat blood for the next three or four hours. I did. I'm serious. God hears me. He knows what I'm talking about. Man alive. And then I got up that night and I mean to tell you my heart was pounding in my chest. I was broken. I broke out in a cold sweat, scared to death, opened up the Bible. And after that got over the fear, words started coming to me. Words started coming. Words started coming. And I knew that I had done what God called me to do. Amen. Father, bless your word. Thank you for the time we have together with your people. I don't know if there's anybody in this house tonight that you're calling, that you're moving in their heart, that you've put a burden upon them for some work, some, some place in the ministry, something that you want them to do for you. If you have, Lord, then that's your calling. It's not mine. But I pray for them. I pray for them, Father. I pray for them. Pray for all the preachers in the house. God, bless them, Lord. Bless them. Fill them with the Holy Ghost. Give them wisdom in the Scriptures, Lord. Give them labor for their souls for their labor. Give them, give them what they need to do what you've called them to do. I ask this now in Jesus' name. And amen. All right. Stand up tonight.